Sunday Night Live. And a few little things to uh, announce, first of all. Uh, next year, next week, our vis visitor is Pastor Bernard Rufin, who's been on our program in the past. He's a Lutheran pastor and a writer. And he's, we're going to discuss Sergio Luzato's book on Padre Pio, which is a negative criticism of Padre Pio. What crust to do that? So you can be sure that Pastor Rufin and myself will have a few things to say about this. Don't miss this one. Uh, also, again, Father Mike Scanlon of uh, the uh, university and myself, uh, Steubenville, will be running a six-day pilgrimage from Washington, D.C., uh, Mary uh, to uh, um, Philadelphia, New York, and uh, the uh, uh, and, and places in between of the Mount St. Mary's, and it's from April 28th to May 3rd. So this is a pilgrimage, not outside the country, but it's a very beautiful visit to many places which are associated with saints, including Philadelphia and New York, both of which have saints buried there and who lived there. If you'd like to find out about it, call 1-800-225-7662. 1-800-225-7662. Uh, uh, and uh, or you can always call Franciscan University. Uh, now, uh, I think that that would be very interesting. Now, we also uh, are th this week uh, paying attention to uh, frequent in the papers, uh, media, uh, sarcastic remarks against the Pope. And uh, I'm, I'm collect collecting these things, uh, and uh, uh, I may have a whole broadcast on this, uh, particularly dedicated to the New York Times, which is really has become an anti-Catholic newspaper. Uh, now, tonight, we've got a very interesting subject, a layman's approach to Catholic theology. And uh, I, I, first of all, want to introduce this idea. This is a very fine Protestant magazine, Christianity Today. I read it every week, every month for years, keeping an eye on the Protestants. And uh, it's a very good magazine. And they have this article, Scientist Sues College for Discrimination. Aston astronomer Martin Gaskell is taking the University of Kentucky to court this month, alleging that it denied him a job because of his religious beliefs. Evidence suggests that Gaskell was the leading candidate to run the Lexington School Observatory based on his professional qualifications. But many cooled to him after finding lecture notes on his personal website that they thought demonstrated a belief in creation or intelligent 
divine design. This is one of the approaches to God, goes way back to people like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, a belief in creation and intelligent design of the reality of the world. Gaskell, Gaskell, who says he accepts evolution, alleges discrimination, pointing to email from one faculty member who warned that Gaskell was, quotes, potentially evangelical. Mm-hmm. You lose a job because you're potentially evangelical. I wonder if they know what the word evangelical means based on the scriptures. Evangelium means the gospel. So uh, things are heating up in this country. People have been rather positively attitude toward religion and faith. But either this is old stuff out of the early part of the 20th century, or it's coming back again with p people like Dawkins and Hitchens. So we'll be looking at this. Now, today I'm talking a very, very interesting friend of mine, Jim Barrett. And Jim is from out in California, Calistoga, and he is an attorney, was attorney for many years, and then he went into the winery business. And many of you, no doubt, have heard of Montalena Vineyards, or Vineyard, uh, Vineyard Mart Montalena. And we'll ask you to put that up on our screen, uh, uh, Montalena. Uh, uh, it means Mount Helen. And uh, Jim has been the director or owner and director of it for a number of years. He's also an outspoken Catholic apologist. And his book, The, the Pilgrim's Journey, very fine book. Uh, uh, and uh, people like George Weigel uh, were uh, uh, people who gave commentaries. Uh, Mike M Michael McLean, president of St. Thomas Aquinas College, and uh, myself. Uh, this is a very fine book, and it's available uh, through uh, the uh, what do we call that when you go for books? Uh, Amazon.com. Uh, Amazon.com. <laughs> and other uh, booksellers, other, yeah. But we want to welcome you, Jim, Well, tonight. thank you, Father. And tell well, us a little shake bit hands about with you. I, I first shook hands with you about 35 years ago. We had the pleasure of being on, I had the pleasure of being on three pilgrimages with you. But I'm a piker compared to my wife, who's been on five. So yes, in uh, fact, your wife is here tonight, and can we ask her to wave herself, Judy, at us? All right. <laughs> I want you to meet J Judy. And by the way, I wanted to uh, mention Mr. and Mrs. Torres. This is the distinguished-looking older couple that comes every week for years, and today is their 62nd uh, anniversary. So when, when they got married, I was still in high school, believe it or not. So <laughs> welcome. And so, Jim, now uh, you're uh, taking an approach uh, that is clearly confronting what is called secular humanism. And uh, many of our listeners not even very familiar with that phrase, secular humanism. Let's start talking a bit about that. Okay. Um, secular humanism is the enemy. Uh, I was uh, in the Navy twice, and the first thing you want to do if, if you're in the Navy is find out... Uh, who the enemy is if you happen to be in a war. I, I was in World War II, uh, but I was a schoolboy. They were teaching me to uh, be an officer, and by the time 
I got through getting taught the war <laughs> was over. So the only thing I saw of, of any hostilities was uh, on the football field when UCLA played SC, and we split with them. Uh, now SC is dominant, and so I've got to think about basketball leaving. That's gone now, so I'm thinking of uh, women's soccer or something like that to, to, to root for at UCLA. Anyhow, I, I got, uh, got out of the Navy and uh, uh, became a lawyer for 28 years down in Los Angeles. And uh, I learned a lot of things as a lawyer. I learned that uh, evidence is very important. Forensic evidence, uh, well, does this bullet come out of this gun that shot this guy? You know, that, that type of a thing. Plus the fact, witnesses. And witnesses can be wonderful. They can also fib like crazy, also called perjury, okay? Uh, they take an oath and uh, uh, that's just raising your hand. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, most of the times, people are, are very, very truthful. Uh, so you have to be discriminating with respect to what the people say and what they're witnessing, too. And witnesses are very important. I don't think we'd all be here as, as Catholics, but for the fact that there are all these witnesses who saw what Jesus did, as a for instance. Uh, so uh, then I, I was, after uh, being a lawyer, I, <clears throat> I decided, I, I'm in a city boy, I decided I wanted to uh, get out in the real world and become a farmer. And I thought, well, a nice way to become a farmer, a gen genteel farmer, is to uh, make wine. And so I looked into it, and I thought, hey, this would be a neat job to get into. So we got into it, and uh, I have a guardian angel that works overtime, absolutely overtime. And he uh, got me this, to this beautiful place called Chateau Montalena. It was a, a, uh, kind of derelict at that time, but now it's... Uh, I have to say, that even to those people who are even outside of Texas, you all come because it's just absolutely beautiful. Well, enough of me. I want to talk about the book because I want to tell you that I got, getting back to secular humanism, uh, they're the enemy. And there's no question about it. They're, they're atheists. And Father here is, is more genteel than I am with respect to them, but I consider them the enemy. And uh, uh, a, a very important Jesuit also did. <clears throat> Uh, he founded the Jesuit order, and he, he wrote uh, one of his <clears throat> uh, it's called a two standards. It, it's one of, one of his meditations. And on one side is, is Christ's army, uh, <clears throat> on the other side is Satan's army. And the war is between Satan and the, with respect to every one of us. And it's a furious war, and there are no non-combatants. We're all involved in it. Because if Satan wins, he, he, the soul goes, if God wins, goes up. It's a furious battle. And guess what? We're not talking about, there's no non-combatants. Everybody's in it. You, me, and every other human being. And it's just that simple with respect to what's going on. And, but if you don't believe in God, uh, I don't think you're going to uh, go to the standard of, of the flag of, of God as, as people. And then when you get there, you should be doing something, not just sitting on your can or, or just standing there watching all, everybody else who are Catholics doing nothing. So it becomes very personal. It's between you and God. And are you going to do it or not? So I thought, I, huh, that applies to me too. So I decided with my uh, education as a lawyer and seeing what was happening to our, our society going right down the tube, it seemed to me, uh, that I wanted to do, uh, write down why I believed, and then I did that. Uh, I, I made my own reflections uh, called Ponce's by Blaise Pascal, and I thought, I'm going to write Barrett's Ponce's, and pretty, but I'm not going to show them to anybody. I'm just going to convince myself, and, and, and it was going to make me a better Catholic, and I'm going to try to talk to people, neighbors and everything. So, and that, But then I thought, hmm. Uh, they've got something called television. I see the uh, I saw Mother Groeschel on it, and, uh, and all kinds of people, and EWT, and Mother <coughs> Angelica, and whatnot. I thought, hey, wait a minute. I think I'll write a book. And I wrote a book, and this is it. And it's just a fantastic book of about a layman talking about it, because it, even with science, uh, uh, there's such a thing as, as, as science, and there's such a thing as scientism, which is theory. And uh, I could go on and on, but in any event, the book uh, got me very, very passionately involved 
in trying to say something to people. And if one soul could read this book, it could be a little old lady in a wheelchair in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, it saved her soul, I think that might uh, go uh, good as a credit uh, for my own soul, which I'm very, very interested in. I'm very egotistical. I want to save my soul. And I think everybody else in this room does too. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you got to get off your fanny and, and do something about it. And that's, uh, that's what I've been doing. Is, so you can tell I'm a little interested in, 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 in the book and trying to get in as hand, in many hands as possible. As You're going right, to have to wait a minute now because they're giving us a break. Oh, a, a okay. blah, blah, blah. I've been talking too much. I'm sorry well, about that. I'll, I'll introdu 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 get in with the middle. And uh, so we'll be back in two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Discussing here with my friend Jim Barrett about his book, The Pilgrim's Journey, is a layman's discovery of the Catholic faith. And he's a, a re retired attorney, uh, entrepreneur of, of a very large uh, company selling uh, wines. Uh, and this book you can get from EWTN. Uh, order it down there from EWTN, The Pilgrim's Journey, and you get a discount when you do it. So, Jim, now gets back to our subject. I'm sorry to introduce you, interrupt you. Uh, one of the questions that is important to people is the Catholic faith or the general Christian faith. We have a large number of very devout Protestant people in the United States. And uh, I mentioned their magazine tonight, Christianity Today, it's evangelical publication. It's very well done. And uh, we are different. We have a single church with a single director and local bishops vis-a-vis -vis the different kinds of Protestants, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists. Uh, what is the big difference from your point of view as a layman? Well, <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, all of us uh, were born uh, in, in certain areas. Uh, if you're born in Saudi Arabia, that's a little bit very, not a little bit, it's, a, it's an awful lot different than if you're born in India or China. Uh, there's good people searching for God all over the wor world. Human beings, ever since Adam and Eve were created, have been uh, either searching for something beyond just a plain old physic physical world. Uh, uh, and I won't get into the secular humanists because they're in anything but God. Uh, people, they just deny it, and and they're they're very um, aggressive in their denial because they say if you don't believe what I believe, uh, it's not worth thinking because we're smart and you're dumb, you know. So that's uh, I'm off the subject because we are, have much much in common, much more in common than most people. But and if you read the New York Times or anything else, you'd think we're in two different worlds uh, with the other. Christians, and that's just simply not true with respect to marriage, with respect to abortion, and on and on and on. All the fundamental, the family, all the fundamentals of those type of things are very much uh, in the context of, of what happened. There's some uh, erosion at the edges, uh, not just with uh, uh, other religious denominations, but also uh, in the Catholics that we've seen in, in, in the 40 years. And, uh, Hopefully with JP2, uh, I think we're seeing a springtime of it and sisters dressing properly in habits. We have some in the, in the audience here. Brothers dressing as they do. And, and they're saying, we're Catholics. <laughs> you don't have to 
wonder what, what they are because they look like uh, everybody else. They're, they're making a statement and a very powerful statement. So anyhow, I don't know whether that answers your question or not because I tend to get involved. Well, you know, uh, you know the, the question, why a Catholic? Well, okay, uh, l let me start with the fact that uh, your mother and father have something to do with it, but people come to the faith because inside each one of us, uh, uh, first of all, if, if you're human uh, and a Catholic, you believe that you have a body, you, you believe <coughs> that you have a mind, and you have what? A soul. soul. A soul. And it's the only living being that has a soul, the human being. The human being, if you believe that there is a God, is what? It's made in the image of God. Well, that's fantastic when you stop and think about it, that you have a mind, uh, you have free will. Those are attributes of God. God has a mind, and he, he says, I think I'll create the universe. <laughs> I mean, this is a human being talking. I mean, how, how can you get into the mind of God? But, we, you know, he... Uh, he's talked to Moses, but very few people. He certainly hasn't talked to me directly. I've got to uh, get it through uh, priests and uh, my parents and, and everything else. And finally, maybe some of it, uh, it becomes my job or, or responsibility to be a good Catholic and, and to try to get other people to be good Catholics. So the real fundamental questions, and you uh, have a master's in theology or psychology, I guess it is, uh, or maybe both, I don't know, but uh, I know at least one. And uh, who am I? You have to ask yourself these very, very basic questions. Who am I? Am I a human being or am I just an intelligent ape who thinks a lot and uh, learned how to knock a banana off a tree or kill someone? You know, so. Or are you made in the image of God? Well, we were, it was, uh, Adam and Eve were doing okay uh, until... Uh, they said God gave them one commandment, wasn't it? And all of a sudden they eat the fruit and now they not only knew good, how to do good or what they ought to do, but they also knew evil and they had appetites and whatnot. Well, that, now I'm getting into your uh, frame of reference, uh, Father. But uh, It's important, it, though, to say to our audience, mm -hmm. many of our audience are Protestant, Orthodox, a number of Jewish people tell me that they listen, uh, Muslim, Muslim people. Why do we believe as Catholics? And the reason is the church began practically at the time of the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. If you go back into the first century and you pick out the leaders of the church, the apostles, and St. Paul, you can find a clear line between them and the first bishops around the world, and emerging very clearly in the second and third century was the Bishop of Rome. Mm -hmm. Not the Bishop of Jerusalem, not the Bishop of someplace else, but of Rome. And this was the home of St. Peter. That's why we call the church St. Mm -hmm. Peter's in Rome. And the Catholic Church comes down through the centuries as the church established by Christ. The Orthodox Church broke from the, Ca the Western Catholic Church around a thousand years ago for a variety of reasons. The Protestant Reformation came when there were scandals and failures and in the Protestant Reformation. It's unfortunate that all these churches are not yet united, but they're getting better. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no question what we call the ecumenical movement moving in that direction. And uh, who knows when with the m m mercy of God where it will lead, but that should be our goal, that there should be a unity of the church established by our Lord Jesus Christ. It's his church. It's not my church, your church, 
or anybody else's church. It's his church. And why? Because he does the work of salvation through the members of the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a tremendously important thing. And you've been appealing to the common sense and feeling of people. Mm -hmm. That's what you're, you're a common sense person. You look that like. Um, and the common sense here is despite all of the failures of Catholics during the centuries, the common sense is that this is where the church comes from and where is it going. The church has had problems, as, as we all know, uh, certainly in, in our situation uh, in the last 40 years, something like that, 30 or 40 years. But one thing is sure is that uh, you see the orders that in the, in the priest, in the formation of priests and, and, and religious is incredible. Everybody's uh, on the upscale, I mean really on an upscale if, if you put a graph to it with respect to the quote JP2 uh, type of seminaries and, and uh, the sisters that are being formed. It, it's just amazing all over the United States and it's just starting and I, 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 railroads and uh, ships have inertia meaning uh, once they, they get moving it's hard uh, to decelerate or accelerate and certainly with a ship because I was on a destroyer and I was on a, on a submarine at different times and once you get it started, it's pretty hard to stop it. Believe me, it's very hard to stop it. And the same thing is true with uh, the momentum that is caused, uh, that is going on uh, as Catholic and, and Christians and then evangelicals in the United States. It's just incredible, and, and it's very, very comforting uh, because the anything but God people uh, uh, are really ticked off. And uh, EWTN, Fox News, those type of things are, are helping. I think, uh, keep our country from going down the tube. Uh, that's, that's my wave the flag in, in, in uh, See, two people often speak to me about pessimism, about the future of faith and religion and churches in the United States. I don't see that at all. Mm -hmm. I don't see that at all. I'm amazed with the endless secularism mm -hmm. of the media. It's absolutely uh, immoral and endlessly uh, non-religious. It really is directly anti-religious because that would cause a lot of trouble. But simply to ignore God and the things of God. It's called worldliness. And uh, it's a huma huge problem in the Western world, uh, in Europe and the United States. I have to admit, and I agree with you, that EWTN has been a wonderful providential gift to the people, a voice for faith and religion and morality. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing, started by a little old lady long ago who was a cloister dud, and she might be watching this tonight. So I Everybody got... loves Mother Angelica, how can you not? You know, it's just amazing. Well, some people who didn't because she could be very direct, mm -hmm. you know, she shot from the hip. Uh, but people who needed to be shot. Well, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but at this point, it's very important that young believers including young clergy, young religious, young people, coming out of the confusion of the 80s and 90s, the 70s. The worst year in American history, I think, as for morality and religion was 1968. And uh, things have been going down ever since. And I would ask for those who are technically and nominally Catholic religious or active members of the church, we need to make our faith very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. This one thing about the reading of the Gospels 
and taking the gospel deeply into your heart. Our Lord Jesus Christ never, ever, ever said an idle word. Never. Everything he said, everything he did was tremendously direct toward the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. And later in this year in, in Lent, I'm going to be doing programs just by myself on Sundays, not having a visitor, to speak about Christ and the teaching about Christ and uh, the understanding of Christ being guided, particularly in recent years, by Pope John Paul mm -hmm. and especially Pope Benedict XVI. He is a man on fire with Christ. Now we have the time for our break and I hope you start calling in questions, arguments, obfuscations, anything you want to call it, but be thinking, put on your brain. And we're having a little competition with the, uh, the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. So call in. Be with be with me. I'll be back in two minutes. Again, next week, a very important subject, the book by Luzato against Padre Pio. And we have a wonderful visitor on that, Pastor Bernard Ruffin, who himself wrote a beautiful book, The True Story of Padre Pio. We, we couldn't do a better person to respond. Now our first call is from Alice. Alice, where are you from, and what are you going to tell us? New Hampshire, and I have a question. Uh, what about people who are brought up Catholic and then uh, don't go anymore, don't go to church? Would this book help them, or how can we bring them back to the faith? And I'll wait for your answer. Okay. I would hope so uh, if they uh, read it, but uh, not fast forward. I mean, if you... If you give, gave the book to uh, uh, your son or whoever uh, and said, you've got to read this, you know, and, uh, and they just sat down and uh, fast forwarded through it, uh, they're going to get zip out of it. It's a book that each chapter, for instance, the first chapter is about the creation of the universe. I, I suggest that that might take a little time to think about because it's a rather big subject. It goes all the way out to infinity, as a matter of fact. So uh, it's a book that I think if they read it, they'd say, because of the evidence. I'm a great believer in evidence and proof and witnesses, and this puts forth a, a, an apologetic, I think is the theoretical term, or at least it's the term, saying it's a defense of the faith, but it's also an attack on, on uh, uh, attacks against it and, and the evidence for it. And the evidence is overwhelming it seems to me, even by the criteria that we would use in a jury. Not a pre certainly a preponderance of the evidence, but not beyond a reasonable doubt. Never ever can you do that when you're talking about uh, metaphysical things. Uh, that, that comes, you have to say, it's, it's not my will, it's your will, God. So I think it would help a lot uh, if, if the book is read. I'd suggest you read it first and see what, what you think. And then if you think it would be good in the particular situation that you're in. You don't want to try to stuff something down. Unless a person is ready to read it with an open mind, um, it's not going to do much good. But it can do an awful lot of good uh, if it's read properly. I, I think also we need to remember when struggling with faith, whether the belief in the existence of God or the divinity of Christ or the teaching of the church, you have to pray. It's not merely an argument. It's not a discussion. It is 
mm -hmm. on pray, on, in, in prayer to the Holy Spirit, to Christ himself, to the Heavenly Father, to be guided. Uh, always, always, faith is a gift of God. It's not an argument. We have a call from Michael. Michael, where are you from, and what would you like to tell us? Yes, Father, I'm from Spokane, Washington. Wow, way out there. Yeah, yeah. We have you ever been to Spokane? Yes, I was, and it was a very lovely city. It is. Yeah, it is. it is. We had a little snow today, but I sure enjoy your program, Father, every Sunday. It's it's very insightful and very uh, comforting. You know, I've been to Lourdes, France, by the way, and it's an experience a person never forgets. And of course, the first apparition is this Friday, February 11th. Yes. Um, but my question is, uh, is there a, to your guest, is there, a, and yeah, he has a great book there, is there a layman's Catholic association to help evangelize the Catholic faith? And if not, maybe your guest should begin to start one. Okay, I got a pretty full plate, and if I wasn't, uh, I'm coming up on 84 years old, and I'm going to have to ask you to start the, that deal, Michael. <laughs> no, that, that's a smart aleck answer, but uh, I, there may be such a thing, but um, there are, uh, the one thing that is, is necessary uh, is, is the young people. I mean, if you have an organization, any organization, you don't have young people in it, uh, the clock is ticking, and sooner or later you're, uh, you're going to become stultified. It's very important for young people to get, get involved and, and to be part of it. And uh, there are groups in the church, uh, and you talk about layman's groups. Well, these are, these are laymen. Uh, there's a group called Focus, as a, for instance, uh, that are working on 40 different ca uh, campuses in the United States. Is it okay if I uh, sure. uh, give an advert for sure. Focus? By all means. Because it's an incredible organization. Judy and I. My wife Judy and I just uh, was up at, at, a, at a gathering, one of, one of the four gatherings they do every year. They're on 40 different campuses uh, in, in the uh, United States right now, 20 more to come. And, and they have missionaries. They're called missionaries because uh, they're, they're leaders. They, they've been indoctrinated into the, uh, going out and become evangelicals on campus for uh, Catholics. Uh, and, and they've, they've been incredibly successful. They're making priests out of people who didn't even, weren't concerned about religion at all. I mean, it's just incredible what they're doing. And we went and we saw 1,500, it was about 1,500 young people, enthusiastic, all, all choked up. And, and, you know, it was, it was like they were in a, uh, at a football game, but they were, you know, they were all hurrah, hurrah. It was fantastic to see that type of activity going on in the right direction. But the inertia we were talking about, I was talking about is just to see that and we could get these young people involved and then they'll talk to their peers and whatnot. The, it's very important uh, especially at the uh, collegiate level because they get tremendous peer pressure. Hey that's, that's not cool you know but now but the people have seen so much uh, of uh, Woodstock and all that stuff and they've seen uh, some of their uh, some of the people who are uh, say you know, I'm looking at these guys now, they don't look all that red hot, men or, or women. I mean, they're, they're looking kind of burned out, if you might say. And they say, hey, wait a minute, I don't, I don't want to be like that. And they're looking at these. Remember when you were 18 and you, you saw people who were 26? That guy's over the hill. That woman's over the hill. I mean, creaky almost at age 30, less, less than 30. That's what, what it is. If you get the young people, uh, you're well on the way to saving a soul, and if you save a soul, guess what? You might just save your own. I would say if you start going with focus and uh, right over the uh, internet, mm -hmm. uh, you'll get through that a number of other organizations and publications about the Catholic faith. And uh, I, I, it seems to me that you, all you just have to do is push a couple of the right buttons mm -hmm. and you're going to get a lot of information. We have a call now from Mona. Mona, where are you from and what are you going to tell us? Uh, I'm from Noble, Louisiana. Oh boy, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, Louisiana. I'm on Toledo Bend. You're what? I'm on, on Toledo Bend. It's a, it's a lake, Father. Oh, I see. Okay. And tell me, what was our question? 
Well, uh, Father, I just wanted to share that over the years, I've been a teacher for 33 years. And, uh, you know, it's surprising how many of the students really want to speak to you. You know, they start off with their problems, but I let them initiate it. And a lot of times they'll ask me, because I'm in a Protestant area, and a lot of times they'll ask me, you know, what it is that, that makes me decide to be Catholic. And I've always told them there's two really main important things, and it's that I can't have the Eucharist in any other church. It's only in the Catholic Church. And when I found out that's the innermost part of his heart that he shares with me, it changed my whole life. And then I have his mother. And I, to know that you have, a, beyond your mother here, a mother on the other side that's so concerned that she's been here since 1981, worrying over us, trying to get us all together, and, the, and they just think. And, and really the easiest way to get God in school is to say, God bless you. When someone sneezes, you'd be surprised how many of the children start right up, God bless you, God bless you, all over the room. So, you know, there is easy ways to bring all of us together, because we do need to dispel the the misunderstandings. I'd like to offer it, and I thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask our <coughs> studio audience if we can get a question or two from them. Uh, there we go. Okay. Not really a question, but an observation. <clears throat> I was um, raised Protestant converted to Catholicism in 1990. And the one thing that's always been um, comforting to me is regardless of where I've been, um, Quantico, Virginia, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Malone, New York, uh, Laramie, Wyoming, 29 Palms, California, whenever I've gone to Mass, it feels like I'm home. It feels like home. The name of the bishops are different, and it you know, takes a little bit of get, getting used to, but it's, it's comforting. It's, it's, it's like home. Well, that's very beautiful that you ask, make that. Uh, we have this young man in the front, uh, who, Brother Giuseppe, who is going to be a priest in how soon? 97 days. 97 days. <laughs> Approximately. Approximately. And, and uh, like our speaker this evening, Father Giuseppe, Brother Giuseppe is also an attorney. And... Uh, Give us a question. Thanks, Father. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess as a man who's going to be a priest in a couple of months, what would you say, Mr. Barrett, the most precise or powerful thing that people need to hear to inspire them to the Catholic faith? Let me put it this way, uh, because I, I, I would have some relatives of my own uh, and we're at a, a gathering at the, at the winery. There's about 40 or 50 of us. It, it's an extended family. And uh, some of these, uh, uh, three of them, including a, a, a nephew of mine, uh, said, you know, everything's relative. Everything is relative. I mean, yeah, and the, the three of them were just kind of looking at this old guy, i.e. me, which is, which is true. That's the only true thing that they've, uh, knew about uh, about me, and I said, "Oh yeah, okay, uh, everything's uh, relative, right?" And I said, "Do you know that you just proved that you don't know what you're talking about? But you just made an absolute statement. Everything is relative." Well, that was a little bit over their heads. So, so I said, "Ah, right, let me give you a couple of other examples. Two plus two equals four. That's in the physical world. Two plus three doesn't equal four. You ever play a guitar? If you get a, a, an E or F or, or a flat or something, you better hit the right string, otherwise you're not going to get that. It's called the, the law of music, scales. And I said, okay, let me see. Let me think of something else. <clears throat> uh, let me see. Oh, at night when you look up, uh, where's the end of that up there? Is that, that relative to anything? It's called infinity. Uh, how about something a little closer to home? living beings. I said, you're going to die. That's a fact. Nothing relative about that. You can you kid yourself, you're not going to die. I said, there's a theological way that you can avoid that. 
but we'll talk about that some later time. But it, 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 it kind of stopped them cold. They didn't want to believe it, and, they, and because of that, they probably didn't believe it, but sooner or later, they're going to have to believe it, or else they're going to die, period. <laughs> and they're going to go one way or the other. That's what the journey's all about, right? Right. Is that an answer to your question or not? Yes, I think you're saying people need to hear the finality of our human lives to better, make them think about the deep it. questions. Yeah, and the Blessed Sacrament is, is a, the finest antidote to uh, that uh, morbidity table you can think of, of a, you know, finale, finito, you know. Are you, you going to just be in the ground while moldering? Well, I'll leave that to John Brown, you know, as the song goes. But <laughs> most of us would rather not have that happen. It's okay with the mortal remains, but wouldn't we like our soul to be somewhere else? I mean, it's, it's a, uh, it doesn't, uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out, that you'd like not to die. Even little flowers open up. Look at grass growing up through asphalt. The fight for life is, is in every being. It's put there by God. So anyhow, blah, blah, blah. I, I just think that's proper. We have a call from Peter. Peter, where are you from? <clears throat> and what are you going to tell us? I'm from uh, Long Island, Father. OK, Pete. Tell me. I'm from uh, Long Island, Father. And uh, my wife and I watch your program and really, really enjoy it. Have you got a question? Yeah, I do, Father. Uh, the question is this. is I have a definition. Yes, I have a definition of uh, secular humanism. And I'm wondering what definition of secular humanism is. Well, uh, in... in uh, you, you know about uh, Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler uh, came out, and uh, you, you know how that ended up in Nazism. Uh, uh, Karl Marx uh, and, and Lenin started something called communism. Uh, then we have socialism. Now we've got secular humanism. All of these isms, you have to look at the end product. I mean, what happens when those things happen? Well, I mean, millions. Literally, hundreds of millions of people have died with all of those isms. And uh, that's bad enough for uh, human beings. But what, ab what about secular humanism because they don't believe in God? Uh, is there any chance of them living eternally? Most of us, I think, would like to live. I mean, why do they keep, try to keep people alive? Why, why are they trying to, uh, in laboratories, uh, try to uh, change by interfering with the, the natural life and creating these monsters, if you will, in, in Petri tubes. I mean, it's, it's just very, very scary. I mean, Frankenstein uh, uh, was <clears throat> uh, keystone cops compared to what these guys are doing in laboratories right now. I'm talking about scientists uh, who are uh, changing, doing unnatural things to natural beings. And, and I, it's a very, very bad thing, and it's not good for humanity, and uh, I don't think God's going to put up with it much longer with uh, what we're doing because uh, it, it's just being very, very, very bad. And then we, we can look the other way and say, oh, well, we're not doing it. Well, uh, I, I think all we can do is instead of saying, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get an ulcer worrying about this, that, and the other thing, the best thing for Catholics to do, it seems to me, is to do like uh, St. James, the, the elder, in, in saying, don't just pray for people and say, oh, I pray every day that you get some food and you get this and you get that. And he says, do it. Get out there and make them and act upon what they believe. And that's what each one of us is, is called to do, is to become an evangelist through our actions. Simple thing. Just be a Catholic, and don't just hide it. I mean, that's the gospel for today, as a matter of fact. It's an interesting thing. I want to make this point. The secular humanism is with capital letters. There's a great many people who are humanistic. They're respectable, mm -hmm. caring people, and they don't have a religious faith. Mm -hmm. Many of them would like to have religious faith. 
I went to Columbia University. I had always gone to Catholic school. And I first went always dressed as a priest. And finally, I went dressed as a friar. I was received very beautifully by faculty and students, particularly the faculty. Mm -hmm. And people were interested. They wanted to talk. They were asking about what it all meant. And I would go back to Columbia. I've been back recently for different things. Same, same thing. Most people are looking for something they could believe in. Mm -hmm. St. Augustine said in the opening of his great book, you, you have made us for yourself, O God, mm -hmm. and our hearts are restless till they rest in pay. You know, you have these writers, Dawkins and Hitchens and various, Hutchins, yeah. who are, mm -hmm. are, are fighting secularism. Uh, what we should be, I, I wouldn't even wa 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 waste time with them. The many people I know who wish they could find God. I wish I could find faith. And if you present it to them, as for instance, someone like Mother Teresa did, the immense number of people in the world deeply moved by that holy woman that I knew very well. Uh, I uh, uh, watched uh, Cardinal Cook, Archbishop of New York, my good friend. People far, far away from any religious situation would love Cardinal Cook. He was... A lot to they, love. They never thought they were going to know a cardinal. <laughs> and uh, he was most humble and friendly and, and very much a New Yorker. Thanks you very, very much, uh, Jim. Well, and thank you, Father. We've got our time closing up here. Uh, oh, Lord, we ask you by the Holy Spirit to touch each and every one of us watching this program tonight or being leading in it, that we will be guided by the Holy Spirit of God's love and help people to find God in his way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. And as always, I have my few words about helping EWTN, keeping things on the radio and on the television. We need your help. And uh, think of my dear friend, Mother Angelica, home now, uh, not well at all. I'm sure she was watching the program, and she'll be sending to send something in. So uh, please, if you could do that, help us, help this wonderful network, uh, which doesn't advertise dog food or anything like that. And uh, please send something to help us at this time. It's a bad time, and we need assistance. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.